Welcome back. You're still watching The Globe on the SABC News Channel. Amnesty International has called on lawmakers from the Southern African Development Community, SADC, to strengthen laws to protect human rights amid growing threats in the region. Major threats threatening stability in the region include violations linked to Mozambique's conflict and a clampdown on the rights to freedom of expression and peaceful assembly, uh, ostensibly due to COVID-19. Amnesty and SADAC's Parliamentary Forum held a virtual meeting to discuss the role of parliaments in enhancing the protection and promotion of human rights in the region. The webinar identified ways for strengthening cooperation between parliaments and non-state actors to make human rights a reality for all in southern africa the conflict in mozambique has been aggravated by militants linked to islamic state uh, the group has been carrying out some gruesome attacks and re recruiting delusioned uh, youth as they try to establish an Isla islamic uh, caliphate in the region up to 2,000 people have been killed and about 350,000 have been displaced in northern Mozambique. Meanwhile, Amnesty has also urged SADAC member states to implement flexible social protection measures to the social and economic effects of the COVID-19 crisis. The session was attended by members of the SADC Parliamentary Forum, Standing Committee on Democratization, Governance and Human Rights and stakeholders drawn from state and non-state human rights actors, civil society, media and technical partners in SADC. And to help us unpack the outcome of this webinar and other related issues, I'm now joined via Skype by uh, Deborah Zmuchena, who's Amnesty International's Director for East and Southern Africa. Uh, thanks very much indeed uh, for joining us and welcome to the program, Mr. Mchena. The human rights groups have one story that they tell and it's one that doesn't paint a great picture in some countries around human rights, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly. Is that something that's been acknowledged by the parliamentarians, for example? Thank you very much for having me, Peter. Yes, indeed, it was a uh fairly useful meeting that usually doesn't take place that often between regional parliaments and their representatives through the committee responsible for governance, democracy and human rights with civil society leaders from the region. I think there was great um, agreement and convergence of thought around some of the key trends that are troubling this region, uh, which have a bearing on human rights. Uh, the first issue that I think everybody agreed with is the contradiction that remains and continues to be there in this region where it is a region rich in natural resources but very poor in human development. A region that can probably produce modest levels of economic growth uh, but the growth is not directed mm -hmm. into human development so that it addresses the triple burden of unemployment, poverty and inequality. And there was also great agreement that parliaments need to play a bigger role in the type of legislative instruments passing through our various parliaments in order to advance human rights rather than to curtail them. All right, so here's the reality. Um, citizens are watching this and they're saying, Mr. Mchena is talking sense, he's uh, making some good points. But the reality, unfortunately, is that those parliamentarians are part of the problem, aren't they? Because they oversee some of the governance and poor governance issues. Correct. I think there is a reason to be frustrated if you are a citizen. And the, the frustration that we all have is the reason why we sought to have this partnership in order to discuss uh, with a group of parliamentarians from the region and also bring into the conversation a variety of other voices that spoke to parliaments today. For example, we raised the question that it is a time when the African Union is talking about silencing the guns. But in our region, uh, we do have many places where the guns are not silent, including in Mozambique, as you led with your story there, but also a number of human rights defenders who are being killed by other guns that have not been accounted for. You will know on 22nd October, Grandmother Fikile Chagashe from Deben was killed by four men who entered the house and killed in front of her 11-year-old son. 
and she was very responsible for a group of people that were challenging mining in their community. Uh, we raised questions of uh, the impact of COVID-19, where legislative interventions to enforce lockdowns have resulted in six state of emergency declarations, six state of disaster declarations, and some curfews. This has given excuses to states to unleash a vortex of other political actions that have tended to marginalize people, but also target political opponents and really attack the rights of media, of journalists, and of civil society leaders. And the challenge was to parliaments to start reversing this tide by not just allowing laws to pass through parliament, but to be passed by parliament. So, again, you know, uh, watching as a citizen, I, I'm, gonna, I'm left asking the question, what's the incentive for these countries and these parliaments to change their ways? Well, these are people's parliaments, and if citizens across the region take an apathetic approach of leaving parliaments to themselves, then more of the same will continue to happen. I think what was clear in the message that came from virtually 12 to 13 countries today was there was a desire by citizens across the region to ensure that parliaments reflect the real will of the people, and that in their lawmaking role, in their executive oversight role, and in their representative function, that we start to see a qualitative shift towards embracing rights and starting to see that their role is not to reproduce the will of the executive, but to ensure that people are protected. And a lot of evidence mm. was put before the discussions. Uh, I mean, to be fair to the Committee on Democracy, Human Rights and, uh, and Governance, there was a pretty much greater convergence and even a critique from parliamentarians themselves that what was being put before was evidence that they also needed to take back to their own home jurisdictions. But a lot of these jurisdictions deny that there are problems at home. They say that they like to talk generally about the region, but no one calls out any country in particular, any incidents within certain countries in particular, um, and I'm not sure how you can make progress when you have general discussions without getting specific and calling each other out. There was a lot of specific conversations uh, and specific evidence. I mean, certainly you know that Amnesty International calls it as it is. We speak truth to power. We reminded parliamentarians, for example, that uh, you know a number of people were killed in Angola between May and June by police that were trying to enforce lockdowns. Uh, we reminded uh, parliamentarians today that in Zimbabwe, we have seen a very harsh targeting of human rights defenders and others who speak against corruption. We've spoken about Zambia, which is accumulating debt in a frightening way as a result of weak oversight on the part of parliaments. Mm. We spoke about the uh, rising impact of gender-based violence that have not only increased as a result of the lockdowns that we saw, where women were locked down together with their abusers. But we've also seen in Namibia the shut it down now being a high point of this rejection of violence against women uh, that we see in our region. So each of the countries raised issues that are concerning them. And there were also human rights institutions uh, that are constitutional bodies that joined civil society in raising exactly the same issues, including in Madagascar, where you see an abuse of the pre-trial detention regime there being used to essentially uh, arrest people for petty offences and fill up jails at a time when you need to decongest them because of COVID-19. So it was very important that these issues are raised with parliamentarians probably uh, in ways that we have not seen before where a regional body has the courage to sit down with civil society from the region and begin to map out a program of action. And we are no under illusion that this will necessarily succeed. It was just one meeting that was an important investment in the sort of dialogue to take control of the legislative space in our countries. I've, I've heard an expression once before where, you know, when countries talk about reform and changing, uh, one person said that, you know, no government is going to reform itself out of power. Again, you know, they might say the right things, but are you optimistic that they will take action because it could mean them losing power? 
Well, we were talking with parliamentarians, uh, not necessarily with the executive uh, arm of governments in Southern Africa. We we're talking, I believe, to a group of multi-party uh, actors that look at the situation very differently. These were not just, uh, you know, representatives of parliament from the ruling party. Mm. It was uh, multi-party delegations of parliaments from all over the region. And the conversation was not really about uh, reforming a government out of power. It was to review the human rights landscape and remind parliamentarians that they have a responsibility to hold the state to account in the manner in which it executes public policy, but also benefit from inputs of civil society about the impacts of COVID-19 in different ways probably than has been presented to them via bills, mm. via laws, via budgetary statements by the executive. So I think it was broadening the space of critique, broadening the space of their own literacy of the, set, of the variety of issues that affect the region so that when they are working both as a parliamentary body in the region but also within their domestic jurisdiction, there is a qualitative mm. shift. One of the things that has happened with the SADC PF in particular is their development of model laws that they want to push forward to be adopted uh, in different national jurisdictions. Some of them, if they are focused on our human rights programs and mandates, I think might get a broader support from the citizenry across Southern Africa. But we are under no illusion that this region continues to face a regression in human rights terms. And it's important that we all play our part in reclaiming freedoms that are lost. Do you think that uh, a grouping such as SADAC um, has enough oversight on its members to effect change because I, I genuinely don't believe that left to their own devices any of those countries will do anything of their own accord. We saw um, institutions like the SADC tribunal being weakened because of that. Absolutely, absolutely. So one of the things that we have is that SADC parliamentary forum is a parliamentary forum. It is not a SADC parliament. And you can see that there has been resistance over the years by executives across the region to transform the SADAC parliamentary forum into a SADAC parliament, because then it will start to have the sort of teeth that can bite. And it is important that at a regional level, oversight on states is increased and enhanced. Uh, we have lamented and campaigned for the restoration and return of the SADAC tribunal. It is absolutely important that citizens of this region don't tire but continue to demand that oversight of SADAC as an executive arm of presidents reflect the will of the people. It's a struggle. It's not going to be something that ends if we throw our hands up in the air. We need to be coming up with campaigns to ensure that people are sufficiently empowered locally, nationally, so that we have more and more uh, demands of people-led regional integration initiatives around human rights around protection, promotion, and defense of the various rights that are under attack at the present moment. All right. So you've had these discussions, this webinar. What would mark success as a next step? What would mark success as a next step first is, um, as I indicated, I have not seen a meeting of this nature between parliaments of the region and civil society groups objectively looking at the attacks that have taken place and suggesting mechanisms of, of um, you know, stopping the regression. So the first success today was uh, sitting in a room and parliamentarians starting to see at that level that people do not have horns, that they are committed to this region as they are. The second is the test of the pudding is in the eating mm. because the encouragement was that at the national level, if we do not see shifts, if we do not see the wisdom gained today being deployed at a national level in oversight, in legislation, and in representation, then this would have been a failure. Uh, but civil society groups in the room are running programs between parliamentary meetings that are not going to dissipate the energy that we have seen and the energy that we need to mobilize in order to reclaim freedoms. We cannot expect freedoms to be given on a silver platter. They are a function of campaigning. They are a function of demand. And they are a function of organizing rather than agonizing. And I think that's what uh, we think we can do together with our partners. 
All right, Mr. Machena, thanks very much indeed. And uh, uh, on behalf of all the citizens in Sadat, we wish you the very best. And uh, let's hope that this gains momentum because uh, uh, certainly conversations like this are needed and uh, uh, they must mobilize into something that can affect change. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Peter. All right, that's uh, Deborah Smcheno, who's Amnesty International's Director for East and Southern Africa, talking to us about very important discussions that have been taking place in the SADC region with parliamentary, parliamentarians and other uh, actors, uh, human rights groups and uh, other partners, trying to find a better space for SADC citizens.